check? Yeah. All right. One for two. Hey, I want to extend my greetings as well. Again, my name is Kevin. I've seen some friends from church and even some Asbury friends, so that is massively encouraging. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you to the Mays family. And just for the opportunity to, to share this evening. So let me jump right in to what I want to talk about. And I actually want to just give a, a couple of upfront disclaimers. So first and foremost, I just wanted to say, if you don't know me, many of you don't, I, I am not a culture warrior. And the only reason I say that is because some might be tempted to think from the title of this that uh, there, there's some kind of I'm at war, I'm, I'm trying to battle against something. I'm not. Um, I believe in trying to give a persuasive witness as people of faith through holy living. And so I just wanted to share that. The second thing that I wanted to share related to the title. And so uh, I, I the original title of this talk may have conveyed that I am against authenticity. I think it said something along the lines of uh, – why authenticity is not a Christian virtue. I'm actually not against authenticity. I think the question is, what is authenticity and how do we get it? How do we secure it? But the third thing I want to say is, is a little unique. I, I, instead of working up to a conclusion, I want to start with my conclusion up front. And, and here it is. I think when we're talking about identity, I think what we're after is durability, a durable sense of self, that my sense of self doesn't ebb and flow with the circumstances of my life, a durable sense of worth, that my net worth, or not my net worth, my uh, sense of worth, yeah, it's not my net worth, um, my sense of worth uh, is, is stable. It doesn't rise and fall proportionate to social media or how I perform at something. And then finally, my sense of action, uh, a durable sense of action, the ability to act even though there might be pressure, or even though there might be social costs associated with that action, the ability to act. And my, my thesis is this. You cannot get durability by following the mantra, be true to yourself. And so that's why I've, I've titled this a little more modestly, The Difficulty with Being True to Yourself. So I want to outline some challenges with, with that mantra and then suggest, I think, a more faithful and fruitful alternative to realize a durable sense of self, self-worth, and action. So let me just start right there. Let me start with that phrase, being true to yourself. I don't think there's an expression that is – more common today than this charge, that you should be true to yourself. So you've heard some variation of this to live your truth or do you or be authentic or forge your own way. And these are variations of a theme that reflect an inward turn in our pursuit to discover meaning and purpose and transcendence. And the philosopher Charles Taylor, who I'll quote a couple of times tonight, he describes this as a shift of authority. He says it's a move from a culture of authority to a culture of authenticity. In other words, authenticity is not looking out or looking up in some traditional way. In this case, it's looking in. So what I want to suggest is even though the aphorism, be true to yourself, is ubiquitous and it's often used, it's advice that's difficult, if not impossible, to follow. So before I, I make some arguments about that, I just want to say a few brief comments about individuality. Like this is not a rant against individuality. Our autonomous self and our relational self are often presented in these zero-sum terms. To have more of one is to have less of the other. And that's not necessarily true. That's not the case. And there's the, the philosopher Montaigne uh, responding to this tension talked about having a room at the back of the shop. I really love that expression. So think of an orderly shop, but at the back of the shop, there's a room that actually reflects more of the personality of the shopkeeper. In other words, even in the orderliness of our social selves we present to the world, we still have personalities. We still have tastes. We still have eccentricities, idiosyncrasies, and other individuated characteristics. I have... Two of my kids here tonight, 
uh, they're amazing, and they're very different. My other son, he's very different, uh, and they each have personalities, and I find them fascinating. I have a personality. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing polka dot pink socks tonight, just to, just to press the point, and sometimes when I'm stressed out, I still shoot on a Nerf goal, just like I did when I was 11, and I'll be 46 next week. And I love the Twilight Zones with Rod Sterling. Like, I can go on and on. I have a personality. I have, an, I have individualism. I have a room at the back of the shop. So do you. So I'm not here to uh, challenge that idea. But here's what I want to say. It's one thing to appreciate our individuality, those characteristics that make us us. It's another thing to consult and exalt the self as authoritative to navigate life's complexities, settle moral dilemmas, forge identity, inspire self-worth, and live our best life. So I just want to offer five reasons why I think this charge, this aphorism to be true to yourself is problematic or difficult, if not impossible. So here's the first one. Which self should you be true to? In other words, the self is not internally coherent. Being authentic seems to suggest a coherent interior life, but our interior self is neither stable nor dependent. There's this great expression by John Wesley uh, describing Jonah, and he calls him a motley mix of all sorts of contrarities. <laughs> Isn't that great? And I, th I think he's right, and I think that actually says something about us. There's a story of Mark Buchanan, the author, in his book, Your God is Too Safe. And he was doing marital counseling for a couple. And they wanted to write their own vows, and he was working through them. But at the end, they said, and we, all, we promise to stay true to each other, but importantly, to stay true to ourselves. And he said, yeah, I, I think your vows are good. I, I'd get rid of that last bit. And he said, no, 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 we want to keep that. He said, no, I think you should get rid of it. And they said, no, we really want to keep it. And then he said this, I promise to be true to myself. If I say that, there's part of me that is joy-filled, generous, trusting, trustworthy. But then he says, there's another part of me, maybe even the larger part, that's slothful, lustful, greedy, miserly, apathetic. I could go on. Which part should I be true to? In other words, he was pointing out that there are a mix of attributes that constitute our self-identity. Some are good, some are ugly, some are defined, some are in process, some are admirable, some are repugnant, some are mature, some are maturing. So therefore, to be true becomes this selective exercise when we appraise a broad range of human contrarities associated with our process of maturation. In other words, which dimension of myself deserves my fidelity? That's number one. Number two, it's not clear what it means to be true or authentic. So even if myself was stable or static, how should we understand the commitment to be authentic? And I say this because there are two primary ways of understanding authenticity. And both are very different. First is, is being authentic an expression of value, some aspiration towards virtue, towards what is good and right and true? Or is being authentic an expression of personal preference, prioritizing personal tastes and desires and urges or feelings? So I think this question is really helpfully raised. I was talking to Nick about this beforehand. In Plato's Republic, the, the Ring of Gaiji story, and you've probably heard this, uh, there, there's this farmer, and um, he, he finds a ring, and he discovers that when he puts the ring on and rotates it, it makes him invisible. And so the question becomes, if someone had a ring that afforded them invisibility, what would they do? This argument's coming from a guy named Glaucon, and Glaucon says, you would steal and plunder. You would satisfy all manner of lust. You would enact revenge on your worst enemies. In other words, you would satisfy 
these appetites that you have within yourself. Why? Because there's no retaliation. It doesn't mar your, uh, your identity, your reputation. You could do it, and you could be invisible. In other words, invisibility affords no retaliation, giving license to express the true intentions of the ring's bearer. Oscar Wilde said, you give a man a mask, he'll show you his true face. Here's the issue. If a magical ring afforded anonymity and the ring bearer went on to satisfy decadent desires or violent impulses because there's no threat of public judgment or consequence or retaliation, are they being authentic? And the question is, it depends. If authenticity relates to aspiring to some value or realizing a virtuous disposition, the answer is no. If authenticity is a matter of expressing inner desires, the answer is yes. And because these judgments about authenticity are contested, the abstract advice to be true to yourself does little to guide us in a concrete situation like this. We have to answer some of these larger philosophical questions about what the word even means first. Okay, third, the expression is a euphemism for expressing individual preferences. So in the absence of answering larger questions about what authenticity even means, the murky nature of the expression is at risk of being wielded as a seemingly positive euphemism to justify any manner of selfish and or harmful activity. So for example, marital affairs, decommitting from relational obligations, the unhealthy indulgence of malformed or deformed appetites, shirking the wisdom of others, being brash and offensive, all of these things find justification under the broad shadow of being true to ourselves or self-care, authentic expression, self-discovery, or me-first nonconformity. And I say this because these are favorable mantras in an age of subjective individuality, but their favoritism belies their potential weaponization against communal norms and relational obligations. In this sense, being true to ourselves is merely a means to justify our individuated idiosyncratic preferences, choices, and behaviors. And you might describe this as another form of what has been called emotivism. And Alastair McIntyre, the philosopher, referred to this as the doctrine that all evaluative judgments are nothing but expressions of preference, of attitude, or feelings. So in analyzing our modern understanding of self, the sociologist Eva Allows notes that feelings have, in this sense, become the basis for our moral action. I thought it was really fascinating years ago. Do you remember Lance Armstrong? He got caught doping. And he went on Oprah. And what did he say to Oprah? He said, Oprah, I got to tell you, I know it was wrong, but it didn't feel wrong. <laughs> I thought at the time, I bet there was some kind of like marketing team that said, oh, say that. Yuval Harari says, in earlier times, it was God who could define goodness, righteousness, and beauty. Today, those answers lie within us. Our feelings give meaning to our private lives, but also to our social and political processes. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The customer is always right. The voter knows best. If it feels good, do it and think for yourself. These are some of the main humanist credos. N.T. Wright, who was here not too long ago, said, where the emotivist says, I feel, therefore I do. The person of virtue says, I've learned to do, therefore I feel. In other words, the feelings will fall into line. There's a fascinating quote that's used. Uh, it comes from Joseph Schumpeter. Um, it's in a, a very popular essay by Isaiah Berlin on two types of freedom. It ends with this. To realize uh, the, there it is, sorry. To realize the relative validity, relative validity of one's convictions and yet to stand for them unflinchingly is what separates a civilized man from a barbarian. Let me say that again. To realize the relative validity of our convictions and yet to stand for those unflinchingly, that's what separates a civilized man 
from a barbarian. Now, he was making that statement in the context of democracy. But as some philosophers have pointed out, like Michael Sandel, if you really believe that your deepest held convictions, your deepest values, your deepest judgments, your deepest beliefs are only relatively valid, and yet you're willing to stand for those unflinchingly, that doesn't make you civilized. That makes you a fool. Peter Kreef says, beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. It's in the power of the beholder's eye to see beauty. Most of us would not want a political tyrant, a habitual liar, a sexual deviant, a non-empathic sociopath, or a, corp a callous corporate CEO to be true to themselves or to stand for those values unflinchingly. Okay, number four. Discovering who you are is still culturally contingent. In his book, Habits of the Heart, Robert Bella refers to an expression, expressive individualism, or the belief that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition inside of them that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. In other words, self-understanding is an inward to outward movement. That is, I look inside to express who I am to an outside world. However, the problem with that idea is that identity and individuality are still culturally contingent. In other words, the individuality we choose to express is still heavily moderated by cultural norms that are specific and unique to our environment. Tim Keller has made the point that if an Anglo-Saxon warrior in the Dark Ages examined his heart and saw aggression, the desire to smash and kill people who got in his way, he might say, this is me, this is who I am. Yet today, if the median American examined their heart and saw aggression and the desire to smash and kill people who got in their way, they would say, this is not me. And hopefully, I need help, something's wrong, right? In other words, self-identity is still tied to what is culturally understood as appropriate, normative, and favorable. And Keller summarizes it like this. You have a morally charged, value-laden grid that is being laid on your heart that you are using to choose what you identify with and what you don't. Someone is going to tell you how to sift what is on the inside. If you've read David Kinnaman's book, Faith for Exiles, which is an excellent book, he says this in our search for identity. Another digital Babylon distinctive is that being different and unique, reflected in the oft-repeated mantra, you do you, is among the highest priorities in quest for identity. Our society de deifies the individual search for self-expression. Ironically, though, most of us end up looking like the crowd we want to be a part of. The apparent value placed on self-expression is actually driven by someone else's preferences. Even when we think we're marching to our own beat, we've got an unseen drummer in our heads, keeping time and making claims on our identity. This is why the philosopher Rene Girard has spoken to the paradoxical conformity of those seeking nonconformity. He says, the effort to leave the beaten path forces everyone into the same ditch. <laughs> the effort to leave the beaten path still leads everyone into the same ditch. In other words, living our truth is not a solitary exercise. You know who understood this really well? It was a guy named Edward Bernays. In the 1920s, he wrote a book called Propaganda, uh, material that would go on to be used in Nazi Germany. But he says this at the beginning of the book, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. The common perception that we are self-defined individuals belies the fact that we're influenced by and subject to a variety of cultural forces and pressures that govern, guide, and mold the preferences and actions we claim as our own. It's a fascinating article by an English professor named Barrett Swanson. He was reflecting on a culture increasingly formed by social media. But instead of beating up all those people on social media, he pointed it back to himself, and he said this, the angle of our pose might be different, but all of us bow unfailingly to the altar of the algorithm. Fifth, 
what if, I suspect you all will agree with me, what if the self is the problem and not the solution? So there's a really remarkable book called Strange Rights by Tara Isabella Burton. And she documents a shift of what she calls moving from institutional religion to intuitional religion. Institutional to intuitional. That is the overriding trend of Americans rejecting formal religious traditions, uh, the rise of the nuns, people leaving the church, all those terrible things you read about, actually has not led us to a nation of Richard Dawkins or uh, Ricky Gervais or uh, Bill Maher, like cynical or strident atheists. Rather, it's the opposite. Today, the American landscape is characterized by what she calls bespoke, remixed religiosity. The examples are funny, if not, <laughs> if not harrowing. Uh, for example, she references the mystical wellness culture of Soul Cycle or Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop. Social justice witches who gather to hex conservative politicians, libertine self-actualizing sexual communes, nihilistic gamers, techno-utopian transhumanism, the self-authorizing meta-narratives of progressive liberals, and the materialist stoicism of right-wing atavists. Paul's words at the Areopagus, remember, I see you are religious people. Amen. It's the same thing today in 2023. But Burton says this, the best summary of intuitional remixed religion is that the source of meaning is found in us, not out there in us. Charles Taylor said secularism is not disbelief. It's just believing otherwise. It's believing something else. It's actually not disbelief. We tend to view our internal self as the solution, but what if it's the problem? And this is where Orthodox Christian doctrine comes in, understanding the self is diseased with sinful in inclinations and disordered desires. Immanuel Kant calls this the crooked timber view of humanity, something that's been repeated by David Brooks. You all have heard Jeremiah 17, the heart's devious above all else. It's perverse. Who can understand it? In other words, we are not inherently good. And I actually really appreciate Martin Luther's definition of sin here, which has been repeated by many other great thinkers. Sin is core in curvatus in se. It is the heart curved in on itself. It's not simply missing the mark, even though that's a definition of sin. It's a disposition. It's inwardness. Being true to ourself in classical Christianity was the crux of our problem. An untrammeled autonomy in this sense is a problem. You might recall Justice Anthony Kennedy who said, central to the idea of liberty is the right to define one's own existence. And I hear that and I wonder, is defining my own existence central to my liberty or is it something else? Because in the Christian story, pressing into my autonomy is not liberation, it's bondage. I have a close friend who's a pastor. I've said I've seen too many people follow their heart all the way to their deepest regret. If the Christian vision is a more accurate picture of our human anthropology, then a fidelity to our inner self will fail to liberate us unto the human flourishing that self-expression and authenticity claim to deliver. So let me turn the corner here and just talk a little bit about this idea of unselfing. And then uh, I just want to make a few comments about maybe a more fruitful and faithful way of thinking about this. So again, expressive individualism it is an idea that's kind of burrowed its way into our collective imagination. But authenticity to our inner self is difficult advice to follow because I think it's based upon contested assumptions regarding the self, authenticity, and human anthropology. And chief among these assumptions is the belief that we are responsible for defining our own lives. And as many commentators have pointed out, this isn't just me, that is a terrible and burdensome cargo to freight upon people, and especially young adults. Related is the assumption that my identity is an amalgam of psychological traits. So Elizabeth Camp has said that our prevailing sense of self 
is predominantly understood as a thread of overlapping psychological, psychological states. In other words, the, the core essence of who I am is my mind and my feelings and my desires and my will. That's who I am. And this abstracts from all relationships, commitments, and attachments. And the interesting thing about this is this modern notion of self, the story is that we don't have a story. So I love the, the theologian Stanley Harvoss. He said, the project of modernity has been to produce people who believe they should have no story other than the story they chose when they had no story. And Michael Sandel, who I referenced earlier, calls this the unencumbered self, this idea that I'm some kind of untrammeled creator of my own identity from the raw material of the world around me, and that I possess the capacity to act independent of the person and places and things in my life. What if another story is true? What if we're created on purpose and therefore we have a purpose? I'm excited that Kate works for CSF. Uh, if you would have had me in class at Asbury, you would have heard me repeat Ephesians 2.10. The NRSV version says, for we are what he has made us. We're created. And we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. That means we have a, pr we have a teleology. And my fulfillment will be bound up in realizing that design on my life. What if we don't choose our life as a path to flourishing so much as we participate in an intended design? What if we're embedded in a story? What if we are relationally constituted and meaning and fulfillment and liberty is bound up in a thickly webbed network of relational commitments and responsibilities? If that is a more accurate account of our humanity, then being true to ourselves is a misleading aspiration. Rather, being true to our intended design is our purpose for living. And in the Christian faith tradition, that means being true to God, participation in the life of God, and it means otherness. It means community. In other words, we are called to unself in this story to realize our true self. It's the great irony of the Christian faith, isn't it? That I actually become whole by emptying myself. In losing my life, life for the sake of Christ, I find it. In binding love, I find freedom. That, that very statement doesn't make any sense in a modern understanding of freedom. It makes sense to Wendell Berry, by the way, who wrote a poem to his wife, Tanya, and opened it with this. What wonder have you done to me? In binding love, you set me free. <laughs> in binding love, I'm set free. I love that. Richard Baucom, the New Testament scholar, says there are two significant human needs that we all seek to fulfill, to be free and to belong. And the false freedom of contemporary individualism has forced those into opposition. Belonging and freedom, these aren't opposed to each other. In binding love, you set me free. And we see this in Revelation, or at Romans 6.22, now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God, binded to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. The result is eternal life. My commitments, my responsibilities, my obligations, I find meaning, significance, value, and identity. Because others are and because Christ is, I am. That's who I am. So what's an alternative? What is a better way of thinking about durable identity. Expressive individualism is contrasted with an understanding of identity and self that's primarily defined by social roles and context. This is, you might say, an old school way <laughs> of thinking about the self, but I think it's right. I want to humbly assert that. And a beautiful picture of this comes from that 20th century French philosopher, Simone Weil. It's spelled W-E-I-L, pronounced Weil. She's a genius. And she writes about rootedness. Being rooted for Weil means being embedded. And in a traditional sense, our sense of self 
is cultivated, it's apprehended, and it's expressed as a function of that rootedness, of that embeddedness. These relationships, communities, social structures that we're embedded in provide a shared story that creates meaning, purpose, fulfillment, and a sense of normative action. Alistair McIntyre, again, if you were to summarize some of his philosophy, it would be this. To know what to do, you have to know who you are. But to know who you are, you have to know the story of which you are a part. To know what to do, you have to know who you are. To know who you are, you have to know the story you exist within. Charles Taylor calls this our background picture, that script running in the background that gives shape to our understanding of the world, our social imaginary. Again, Taylor talks about what forms this robust identity. My identity, your identity, is defined by the commitments and identifications which provide the frame or the horizon. Again, this background picture within which we can try to determine from case to case what's good, what's valuable, what ought to be done, or what I endorse or oppose. Again, my identity is defined by commitments and identifications. And I think rootedness, real rootedness, healthy rootedness, is where we get durability. A durable sense of self, a durable sense of worth, and a durable sense of action. What to do in a given circumstance. Actually, by the way, this is why uh, Wei w had such a strong critique of colonialism, uh, specifically German-occupied France. Uh, just like if you were to take a flower from a flower bed and pluck it up and go and dump it on a table somewhere and expect it to live, it's like, no, you've killed it because you've taken it from its system of life. And when you colonialize, that's exactly what you are doing to a people. And while we don't have forces of colonialism, at least in some of the overt ways she experienced, I would humbly suggest modern America has a variety of forces that serve to disembody, atomize, and isolate us. In other words, uproot us. Modern forces disorient us. They break our compass for who we are and where we are going. And to lose orientation, says Taylor, is to not even know who we are. If we lose that orientation, you don't even know who you are. Taylor says the portrait of an agent free from all frame frameworks rather spells for us a person in the grip of an appalling identity crisis. Uh, I see some friends from our Sunday school class at church, First Alliance. Uh, we have an agronomist from UK who is in our Sunday school. He was teaching once, and the person introducing him said, this is Chad, he's an agronomist. That means he studies dirt. And Chad came forward and he said, it's soil. I thought that was really fascinating. And so I went home and I looked at what's the difference between dirt and soil. Uh, I, I didn't know this. Soil is alive. Soil has an ecosystem that fosters the nutrients necessary to sustain life and create life. Soil is alive. And the definition of dirt is displaced soil. Isn't that fascinating? Dirt is displaced soil. I think there's a metaphor here. Uproot a human, disembody, decommunitize, decontextualize them, and they lose their livelihood. We're just displaced soil at that point. Let me give some examples of what I mean by rooted. And I like to start with examples that are actually in pop culture. I love to see things, and I'm like, you're onto something, you may not even know it. I'll share one, I'll try to get through it without crying. Uh, I'm, I'm like a sucker for um, contemporary folk music. And so there's this song by Brandi Carlile called The Mother. Does anyone know that song? Great. It's an amazing song. I'm gonna read the lyrics, some of them to you. This is what I'm talking about. She says, this is about being a mother. She says, welcome to the end of being alone inside your mind. So you live inside yourself. Welcome to the end of that. You're tethered to another, and you're worried all the time. You always knew the melody, but you never heard it rhyme. She's fair, and she's quiet. Lord, she doesn't look like me. She's made me love the morning. She's a holiday at sea. The New York streets are busy, 
as they always used to be, but I am the mother of Evangeline. The first thing she took from me were selfishness and sleep. <laughs> Amen. She broke a thousand heirlooms I was never meant to keep. She filled my life with color, canceled plans, and trashed my car. But none of that is ever who we are. Outside my windows are the mountains and the snow. I'll hold you while you're sleeping, and I wish that I could go with all my rowdy friends around, accomplishing their dreams, but I am the mother of Evangeline. And they've still got their morning paper and their coffee and their time, and they still enjoy their evenings with their skeptics and the wine. Oh, but all the wonders I have seen, I will see a second time. From inside of the ages through your eyes. And then she ends by saying, those friends of mine, those rowdy friends doing all the exciting things they're doing, they can keep their treasures tied to the machine. I'm the mother of Evangeline. There's another uh, Fleet Foxes, uh, another contemporary band. They have this amazing song. It's one of those, you hear the opening lyrics and you pause immediately. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, it's called Helplessness Blues. It starts like this. I was raised up believing I was somehow unique, like a snowflake, unique among snowflakes, distinct in each way you can see. But now after some thinking, I'd say I'd rather be a functioning cog in some great machinery serving something beyond me. Wow. Rootedness. Maybe I've been told this story that my best self is my individuality, that I'm this distinct person, unique among all others. But what if my best life and my self-understanding and my meaning and my fulfillment is a cog in a machine serving something greater beyond me? Let me give some other examples. I had the privilege of being in Israel a couple of years ago. My wife and I met a family, and their son and daughter-in-law had dinner with us. And they said, Kevin and Maria, tell them about yourselves. And I was like, well, uh, you know, I work in Wilmore, and I don't know what lame things I told them. And they asked her to introduce herself to us. And she started with her great-grandfather <laughs> and worked her way through her family tree to her social location. In other words, if you want to know me, you need to know this family story. My great-grandfather, my grandfather uh, in a Nazi prison camp, my father, how he met my mother, our shared history. That's who I am. I remember being there at the hotel and watching these Jewish dinners uh, till midnight, singing songs together, rehearsing their stories together. And yeah, it might look a little strange, but boy, did they have a durable sense of self. They have a durable sense of worth. They know what to do in the face of consequences and social cost. Let me just give one more example. It's a little bit more of a humorous one. I shared this with our students uh, a year or so ago. So we used to live in Anderson, Indiana, and we didn't have a lot of money. We were in this really, really tiny rental house. And if you've been in northern Indiana, it's freezing. And this house got so drafty in the winter. It was so cold. And one night, in the middle of the night, my son Campbell he came to the top of the stairs and did that, like, Mom, you know, Dad. I, I don't know why he didn't say Dad. And uh, Maria went to the bottom of the stairs, and she's like, are you okay? Are you going to barf? And as soon as she said that, he just yacked everywhere. And we had this, like, these wood planks. It's really steep stairs. And do you remember slinkies, like, <laughs> cascading down the stairs? There's not a person in the United States more averse to vomit than my wife. And so she was like, Kevin, I think I'm going to throw up. And like she like ran away herself. So I remember just kind of rolling over the side of the bed. I'm freezing cold. It is so cold. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm about to clean up vomit for uh, you know the next half an hour. And what did I do? What were, what were my choices? There wasn't a choice. I got up put on some sweatpants, sweatshirt, and I cleaned up vomit. Why? Not because I'm virtuous. Not because I drink a five-hour energy or coffee. 
not because I thought, this will be funny on social media. Not because I felt like it, definitely. I did it because I'm a father and I'm a husband. You know this, right? There was no choice. You don't opt out of that. Because if you're a father or a husband, you clean up vomit at 2 in the morning. It's like the, I'm the mother of Evangeli. This is what I do. Uh, I'm a parent. Because I'm a son, because I'm a brother, because I'm a husband, because I'm a father, because I'm an Asbury employee, I report to a board. I work with a vast community uh, that know me and expect things of me. I heard someone say once when I started in this role as an administrator, they said, there are things you're not going to want to do, but the president will have to do it, and the president will take you with them. <laughs> That's been very true. I'm a member of a church, and I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. Let me point out, all of those things limit what I can do. They constrain, they militate against modern notions of freedom and unencumbered, unlimited liberty to choose and act as I see fit. They moderate my choices. They constrain, guide, regulate, and govern my beliefs and practices. But here's the thing. They are a source of freedom, identity, significance, meaning, fulfillment. They are a key to my flourishing as a human being and a human that is relationally constituted, as Wesley says. Richard Bauckham again says, genuine freedom, as opposed to the freedom imagined by hyper-individualism, is not self-constituting. It's not independent of anything outside itself, but is constituted and formed in human relationships and in concrete situations. I, I got to read this quote. It was a comment. It might be the best comment I've ever read in a comment section. It was an article about feeling valid. And this person said this. Her name was Kathleen McCook. She said, when you take care of something else, a child, a pet, a garden, you don't feel valid so much as connected to more than yourself. I never worried about my validity while changing a diaper. I never worried about my validity when caring for an old dog. I never worried about my validity when planting flowers. When these thoughts about my validity arise in my brain, I try to do a task for someone else or something else. So let me conclude. First, let me say it's not enough just to be embedded. We, this is, we know this, but I, I just feel compelled to say it. There are obviously many forms of community, relationship, or codependencies that can be unhealthy or harmful. We know that. I'm talking about rooting ourselves in Christ and rooting and planting and embedding ourselves in community deeply. Moreover, we pattern our lives after the virtues and the habits and the practices that honor these identities and associated commitments. Again, to know what to do, you have to know who you are. And to know who you are, you have to know the story you exist in. We used to have a former employee, her name was Kaylin. Kaylin Moran was her maiden name. And she used to say this all the time, why are we doing this? And her parents would say, you're a Moran. Morans do hard things. Why do we have to go there? You're a Moran. Why do I have to give up my money? You're a Moran. Uh, she knew what to do sh because she knew the story she existed within. The last thing I'll say is, how do you know you're rooted? I want to, I, I think belonging, this idea of belonging, um, affirmation, validity, I think this always starts with being kind and accepting and loving. Always, always. I've joked before, kindness should always mark our Christianity. That's like saying, that car comes with a steering wheel. Of course it does. Of course we should be kind. But mature forms of belonging, mature forms of rootedness demand something of us. There's a pastor, I remember them saying, obligation means you belong. How do you know you belong? Are you obligated? I've shared a lot in our community. Uh, Dr. Sidney Penner's wife uh, teaches English for us, Dr. Erin Penner. She gave a great chapel a few years ago, and she said, if your community does not demand something of you, it's not a community. 
communities demand. When we talk about identity, I think we care about affirmation and validity. But again, I think, I think the end game is durability, a robust sense of self, sense of worth, sense of action. And I've sought to argue tonight, we don't get that by being true to ourselves, a popular but difficult aphorism to follow. I think we get it by being rooted, rooted in Christ, rooted in community. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for a few questions. Awesome. I'm going to kick it off if that's okay. Please, ask the first one. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. We're going to just do a few questions if you're up for it. And so I'm going to kick us off with one. So uh, I, I was born in 93, and so a lot of things have happened in my lifetime. Uh, we've seen the emergence of this thing called social media during my lifetime. And I wonder, could you speak to how maybe this has complicated things some, social media, this topic of authenticity? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, um, social media is also embedded in a technocratic society where um, all problems are technical problems and all solutions are technical. And uh, we were just talking about this on the car right here, actually, that we're um, kind of an outcome, um, an outcome-centric society as well. So if it's all about the outcome, um, if it's all about the final product, um, we might imagine a world where social media then would, uh, the it's fertile soil um, to, to take off. I mean, I, I don't want to be one of these people that um, here are all the problems with social media, and uh, I think like all things, there can be some benefits, uh, and there are a lot of risks as well. But I think everything that I just mentioned, that if I'm tying my sense of self, uh, if I'm tying my worth to how do people respond, how do people validate me, um, that is a really capricious source uh, by which to experience or hope to seek the kind of durability um, that, that I think we're after. And I don't, I, I have a LinkedIn account because I had to make one years ago. I don't have any other social media. Um, but if I were like write an article and someone makes a comment about it, I mean, I, even there, I'm like, well, I guess I'm a terrible author. You know, uh, like it, it is just so easy to collapse on ourselves. Uh, and it's not actually, it's, it, you're not having an exchange. Um, let me, the, the darker thing I would say about social media is it is just an egregious euphemism to call some of those platforms, um, what's an expression someone used, um, like the digital town square. Uh, that sounds really nice when in fact the, the very models, the very, the business model is organized around public scorn and uh, basically content that shocks the limbic system. Um, Tristan Harris had a really fascinating quote. He's a tech ethicist now. He used to work for one of these companies, maybe Google. Uh, but he made this comment talking about the very business model. Like, when does it make money? When does it do well? He says, when you're outraged, when you're anxious, when you're polarized, when you're suspicious, when you're uncertain, he said, you are success cases of a business model that's seeking to get your attention. Uh, that was a really, really profound quote to me. Uh, so I think it's always important with those things to look at the business model. But then to ask the question, if something like what, if my assumption is true and durability is what we're after, is this a legitimate means to realize that? Thank you. That's great. Um, we've got a mic, too. Uh, just a few questions. If anyone has an interest, raise their hand. I've got one more, if that's okay, before we move on. But if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Oh, we've got one right here. Let's, let's hear from someone else. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, so there was a lot of information that uh, I would like to share with my family, but I won't be able to parse it as well. Is there going to be a recording of this, by any chance? Yes, there will be, yes. That's Where would I find that? Um, our website, yeah, and if you have questions, uh, you can come talk to one of our staff members after about that. So we'll be, I'll be around, and we got some of our friends in the back who are on staff. They can, they can help answer that. So is that questions. Lewis House or CSF? Lewis House, yeah, okay. lewishouse.org. Mm -hmm. All right, thank yes. you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Um, I had a, I had two questions. Um, one was you you mentioned uh, prior that the self is innately or inherently bad or what was you said that and I was wondering if you had any beliefs about it being any part of good and 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 um, that was the first question and I I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I have another one after that yeah I I think. So there are a couple of different views. One, um, like the Rousseau view, uh, is what I'm in. Like we are born free, and everywhere um, put in chains or something like that. We're born this blank slate, but our institutions and the way society is is actually what coerces us into unsavory behavior. And so you might hear someone like Bill Maher, uh, who's an atheist, religious cynic, say something along the lines of people were pretty good people for the most part, but it's religion that makes them want to um, go into war or something like that. And a Christian response is, no, actually I think that's just in us, uh, that the wind blows towards hell, uh, to use an expression by A.W. Tozer. But that doesn't mean we don't have a capacity uh, for right, good, and virtuous action. And uh, Jamie Smith is going to talk about habits here pretty soon, and he would say uh, within those capacities, he would look at doing what he calls a liturgical audit, uh, where we audit what are those things that reinforce what we love and habituate. So every day we're disciplining ourselves into something. The question is, what are we disciplining ourselves into? Uh, and virtue is a volitional act towards the good uh, which makes us into the kind of person that uh, is virtuous. Virtuous people do virtuous things. They practice virtuous things. So we certainly have that capacity. What I would reject and I think is consistent with the Orthodox faith tradition is that we're born these neutral slates uh, that uh, are coerced into bad uh, decisions or unsavory things by the environment that we're in alone and not because we actually have a bent, a heart curved in on itself. Yeah, I appreciate that. And then the, so, well, do you, so you think it's, um, we're not a mixed, we're not a mixed bag of good and evil, but that, okay, we're, okay, yeah. And I, yeah, I wouldn't say we're 50-50. Yeah. I, I would say, uh, yeah, as, as I, I love that Tozer expression, the wind blows towards hell. Okay, yeah, and then my second question is, um, in my experience, um, I've met a lot of people, and, and including myself for a certain time, couldn't um, and didn't know self in a sense that I couldn't even, and, and so many people I meet today can't find what they feel or express or explain what they feel. And to what extent would you prioritize um, finding yourself in that sense and so that you had a self to die to, because I feel like in the teaching of Jesus, you died a self, and that is virtuous life. But, but I, I think there's an experience of people um, don't have a self to die to, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, I, as I said, I'm not anti-individuality, and I think feelings really, really matter. I mean, all of us in this room probably can remember things from when we were really young where our feelings were hurt, but I can't remember, you know, an email from yesterday uh, because our feelings are so deeply embedded within us. So I think uh, the idea of self-appraisal and reflection and all that is incredibly important. Uh, I'm the son of two counselors, uh, therapists, and so I, I think that's really important to uh, uh, sit and uh, have some of those exercises where we explore the interiority of our feelings and emotions so that those things can be expressed. I think that's different from saying uh, the essence of who I am um, is only my mind, my emotions, my will, and my desires. Um, that amalgam of those things is all that I am. Uh, I'm also a body. I'm also embodied. And I'm also embedded in a certain social environment that helps me and I would say roots me in ways that I can more fully understand and have a strong sense of self, worth, and um, action. I'm going to talk at Asbury in a couple weeks and uh, tell 
uh, what's a funny story now and was terrible at the time, uh, in college, uh, some of the adults might remember a thing called strength shoes. I played basketball in college, and I worked out a lot in these shoes. They're like platform shoes, and they put this inordinate amount of weight on your front foot, and I broke both feet. And so I had to wear <laughs> two boots, like, and I'd kind of duck walk around and, like, you know, wear a nice shirt and then sweatpants. And it was terrible. Overnight, overnight, I lost all sense of self because I only knew myself as a basketball player. That's all I was. I, I didn't, it was like I didn't know who I was. Talk about being uprooted. But I think what I came to realize was that was a really shaky, capricious sense of who I am. And I needed something that was more uh, steady and rooted and embedded um, to have a stronger sense of self. So when those things in life happen that are good and bad and uh, hopeful and uncertain, uh, it doesn't sway our strong sense of who we are. Uh, so what you're describing, I think I'm all for that, where people like, how do I really, what am I feeling, and who am I, and really seeking to answer those questions. It's a great exercise. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just a couple more. I think we have one right here. Um, you mentioned kindness being kind of the trademark of the Christian response essentially to the world who is saying X, Y, and Z is who I am, whereas the Christian worldview would say that's how you are, not who you are. Um, so do you have some practical advice for those of us who work in secular workforces? For example, I work here at UK Hospital where if, as an employee, if you would like to, you can wear an extra badge with the pride and the trans flag on it that says safe, which implies I'm a safe employee for you to be your authentic self to me. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, then the patient is un uncertain as to if you are a safe person to be their authentic, authentic self in front of. So with the kindness aspect of it, what practical advice would you give in summing this up with a world that doesn't see this as the way that most of us in this room see this? Yeah, great question. And to be clear, the, the comment about kindness was that belonging or any tempt, attempt at acceptance begins with kindness, just begins with that. It certainly doesn't end with niceness. I think there's this really shallow idea of love as niceness uh, where I just am given to give unqualified acceptance of your idiosyncratic preferences or whatever. And that, uh, as opposed to a definition of love, to will the good for another, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Um, here's what I'd say, here's my best attempt at answering your question, and this I is going to be contested. Um, so I grew up, uh, like any Josh McDowell fans in the room, like I, I loved that stuff when I was like in the 80s and 90s, like here are the six reasons the resurrection happened. And I, I still do, I, I love like that form of apologetics. I think today, I think in 2023, we make the apologetic with our life. That is the apologetic. Some questions that, it's interesting to look at the questions that people are asking now. I just met with a pastor yesterday who's influential and he's made this comment that People aren't asking the church for their beliefs on right and wrong. They're asking, does it work? John Dixon has made this comment. People aren't asking, is Christianity true? They're asking, is it good? Russell Moore has said people aren't walking away from the church because they don't believe what the church is saying. They're walking away because they don't believe the church believes what the church is saying. Our life is the apologetic. So it's something I say at Asbury a lot, and not because I don't have other quotes. Uh, it's just so relevant. It's Gypsy Smith. He said there are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian, and most people will never read the first four. The very way that we lead our lives and the Christ-likeness that is in us is the fifth Gospel, and that will be the thing that gives currency to fund any words that we use to talk about Jesus Christ. And so I think before we even approach some of those really difficult questions of what does it mean to bear witness in 2023, it's not going to be with a propositional argument. 
and young folks probably know what I'm talking. If you want to shut down a Gen Z person, walk up to them and just drop a propositional argument in their lap. Um, they're done. Um, but if they look at your life and they see some kind of genuineness and consistency and there's a relationship there, then you've established some kind of platform to actually have a meaningful conversation with them. Um, but in the absence of doing that, and that's where, that's another reason I wanted to change the title. Authenticity is a really important value. Um, I, I wanted to say this at least, when I say authenticity, the, the kind I'm talking about here, in February of this year, uh, something unlike anything we've ever experienced at Asbury took place. You all probably know about this. And when people have asked me about that, the best answer I have for young adults is that they they have had enough. Uh, other people have had enough. Young adults are the most marketed to generation in human history. Uh, they have had more opinions dumped on them. They have had more people say, this is how you should live. Talk about propaganda. But I think the larger world, too, people have had enough, and they want some. What can I anchor myself into amidst the dizzying swirl of absolute dynamism taking place around me? Give me something real. And I asked a student about that, and he said something fascinating. He said, oh, I agree with you, but I wouldn't put it that way. I don't want something more. He said, I want something less. Um, and so that's where authenticity is so important. Give me something real. Give me something genuine. Give me something that won't turn and change when I touch it. And if we can do that, if we can be a peculiar people, resident aliens who are not tethered to the patterns of this world, whether it's politics or anything else, it will be a compelling witness. It will be the fifth gospel. That is my deep conviction. And that will give us the platform. That will give us a kind of symmetry to have these difficult conversations with those and not be at war against them. That might be wrong. That's my best attempt to answer your great question. I think, I think my friend Jack had a question over here. Did I see that right, Jack? See? Yeah, I'm using mine too. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Brown. Thank you for coming to speak. I wanted to ask a question about rootedness because I thought that that was a very compelling point, especially you mentioned going to Israel and having long story should be, oh yes, uh, if you want to know about me, go all the way back to my great grandfather. I definitely agree, I think that that's very important. But something in our current culture, I guess, is just the fact that a lot of people don't have that background for a variety of reasons, be that through coming from broken families or even simply from, you know, someone only ever grew up with their household and only very rarely saw their extended family. So for anyone who's coming from these or similar backgrounds where there isn't that sort of generational rootedness, how would you recommend, or would you have any recommendations for how to lay down roots so that their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can then have that sort of rootedness? Because while it's very, maintenance is important, but I think creating something new is very difficult. So that was something I was interested in. Thank you. Great question. Um, my, and I, I'm not trying to undermine the question when I quote the great theologian Lucy from uh, Charlie Brown. I can't remember if it was the Thanksgiving or the Christmas episode where she said, Charlie Brown, you need involvement. <laughs> You're right. The, the, we don't have this kind of communitarian culture that Israel has with deep family roots. Uh, and there is so much family brokenness. Um, so the best thing I can imagine uh, to give us what we need is involvement and just finding those places where we can, in embodied ways. I, I love that quote by that woman, like, even if it's <laughs> taking care of a dog or planting a flower or changing a diaper, and there's always a place to serve, always. Um, I, I've shared before, when I have really been in a funk and if you ever done you're just inside yourself and you're just lathered up into this like neurotic craziness uh the best thing i can do is get outside myself and that's being involved in something that pulls me outside of some of those internal neuroticisms and then i have a much more stable sense of who i am because someone else is telling me that 
Um, again, that it, there's a philosophy of relational personhood that has some really much better language than what I'm using about this. But I've told this story. When I finished my graduate work, I, I uh, sent a letter to family and friends to thank them. But the best way I knew how to thank them was to say, because you are, I am. Um, you're the ones who have, in fact, let if I'll tell this story really fast. I'm sure I'm like uh, going way over on time. Really important point. When I was in college, and I know there are a lot of college students in here, uh, as I said, I played basketball and broke my feet, wore these boots, and then like overnight, I'm like, I, I'm no, I don't even know who I am. And I started dating my wife, Maria, and um, I remember at one point she came back from visiting her parents. She had a book for me, and it was by someone in apologetics, and she gave it to me, and I said, what's this? She's like, oh, my parents thought you would like this. And I'm like, why do they think I would like this? And she said, oh, they said you're a thinker. Now, that was extraordinary because I had – I never thought I was – unintelligent, I had never conceptualized, uh, I, I've never thought of myself as a thinker. I read that book like a thinker. I have it today. It's like everything's underlined, you know, like highlights, things written in the margins. That changed everything, everything, because someone had conferred a healthy identity upon me. Um, they had named, they, uh, there's an expression, hypersy being able to see raw material and see something within it. And so when I finished that graduate work and I said, because you are, I am, I wrote something special to them. I said, I have a degree today because you called me a name in the past. That's what I mean by involvement. People who can pull us out of ourselves and confer a healthy and more realistic identity upon us and one that will be more stable and durable than what we might get otherwise. But I fully take the uh, the point of your question, which is excellent. Dr. Brown, thanks so much for being here. Would you all put your hands together and thank Dr. Brown?